Eternal Father of mercy and compassion, may your spirit empower lead us and give us wisdom to understand your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Greetings and blessed Sabbath, brothers and sisters, wherever you are all over the world. May the Lord truly bless you. This is the Herald Report. My name is Kudzai Gogora, your host. And today, brothers and sisters, we are looking at this wonderful subject, Cost of Arrogance and Pride, Plan B, Seven Years of Probation. We are looking at this subject as we are building up from what we, where we left a few days ago when we spoke about Israel. But today we are looking at the long suffering and mercy of God. We are looking at the way how the judgment of God can come to humanity. We are looking at the way how God deals with humanity in the language with humanity. Understand, we examine the story of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. These are the kings of Babylon. But however, the ultimate thing that we realize is that God is merciful, but his mercies can only stretch up to a certain time. If you remember yesterday, we spoke about the close of probation, but before the close of probation, God would do everything to save humanity. Remember, the Bible says in the book of Exodus chapter 34 verse 6, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaim the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilt, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. Now, I want to pick what verse 6 says God is merciful. God is long-suffering. God is kind. But the verse following verse is very clear that God will definitely visit the iniquity of those who have not repented. Brothers and sisters, God is not a human being. Neither does he think like human beings. His desire is to save all humanity. God is not cruel. We could either cooperate with God and then he will save us. Or we could actually reject God and then we will be lost. You know, this is very interesting. So I look at the story of Nebuchadnezzar as a very interesting story. The man who God dealt with for years. And because that did not work, God decided to use a different plan to reach him. Because God had a desire to save him. But before I talk about that, let me actually go to Daniel chapter 4 from verse 10. The Bible says, That's where the visions of my head in my bed I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth. And the height therefore was great. Remember, this is a dream of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. He is relating the story of how God spoke to him and how he repented. Verse 11. The tree grew and was strong and the height therefore reached unto heaven and the sight thereof of the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair and the fruit therefore much and in it was meat for all the beasts of the field had the shadow over it and the fowls of the heaven dwell in the barrow thereof and all flesh was fed of it. So now he is describing there was nothing missing in this tree. The field, the, 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 the birds of the air, the animals of the forest, the humanity, Everyone feasted from this tree. The tree was the supplier of everything. The tree was very rich. Now look at verse 18. And I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed. And behold, a watcher and a holy one come down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, You down the tree and cut off its branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit, lest the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. So this is the judgment that comes to the tree. You down the tree, prune everything, remove everything, just leave the stump. Verse 15, nevertheless leave the stump of his roots in the earth, even with the band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from men, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and least seven times pass over him. So this is what uh, 
the dream is all about after leave the roots leave the stem for seven times for seven years or less until seven years have passed verse 17 this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the de demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of heaven and giveth it to whosoever he will and set up over it the the, the bestest of men now God is conveying a message. He's helping the king to understand that there is a God of heaven that can rule. He decided to use a tree. But now look at verse 18. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had seen, O thou, O Belshazzar, referring to Daniel, declare the interpretation thereof for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, therefore the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. So now the king has been given a dream. The dream is very frightening. Daniel has listened to the dream. Now, I want you to understand something. The, the chapter, chapter 4 of Daniel give us a full understanding of what this is all about. But I want to say that in prophecy, humanity is likened unto trees. As we have covered uh, previously, we talked about the vine. We talked about the two trees in the desert, the cedar tree, the palm tree. But uh, I want us to look at, um, in fact, let me actually say the righteous are described as trees. The unrighteous are described as trees. Let me take you to the book of Psalms chapter 1. Very interesting. And he shall be likened at, like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall neither shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So humanity are like trees. The righteous like a tree which is planted by the rivers of waters. But what of the wicked? Psalms chapter 37 verse 35 the Bible says, I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passes away and lo he was not here. I sought him but he could not be found. So the wicked are like a tree, green bay tree. Now the righteous are like a green tree. So Nebuchadnezzar is given an image of a tree and this tree is representing him as the big tree where everyone is coming to get shelter, where the birds of the air do their nest, where the animals of the field, they come and rejoice under the tree, where humanity can also come to get shed. Now the question is, why is God giving this vision to Nebuchadnezzar? Now, it says uh, in the book of Testimonies, volume 8, page 127. So the Lord magnified himself as a true and living God. Well might David exclaimed, I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Yet he passed away and lo, he was not. Yea, I sought him, but he could not be found. Why? Let men become lifted up in pride. And the Lord will not sustain them and keep them from falling. Could it be that we are dealing with a king who was so proud like a green bay tree? And now we say when humanity lift them up like a green bay tree, when they become so proud, definitely the next thing is to fall. Not only humanity, but now look, it says, let a church become proud and boastful, not depending on God, not exalting his power, and that church will surely be left by the Lord to be brought down to the ground. Let a people glory in wealth, intellect, knowledge, or in anything but Christ, and they will soon be brought to confusion. The question is, what happened when people are proud? We are talking about the king of Babylon. We are talking about the king who is so pride, proud. Pride hinders repentance. Pride works as an obstacle for many to listen to the God of, head, to the God of heaven. Pride will make many never to appreciate the goodness and mercies of God. Now, this reminds me of what Nebuchadnezzar was doing. 
the dream is given to Nebuchadnezzar. God was preaching to Nebuchadnezzar. God was teaching Nebuchadnezzar. But you need to realize that for years God had been teaching Nebuchadnezzar. God was trying to reach Nebuchadnezzar. But because of his pride, because of his arrogance, because of his self-sufficient, Nebuchadnezzar could not understand the God of heaven. Now, let's look at the way how God was dealing with Nebuchadnezzar. And also think of the way how God is dealing with you. In Daniel chapter 1 from verse 1, the Bible says, In the third year of the reign of Joachim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged. And the Lord gave Joachim, king of Judah, unto his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God. The Bible is clear that God gave Nebuchadnezzar, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar should have understood that there is a God of heaven who has handed over his vessels, who has handed over his people into his hand. The people of Judah or the king of Judah was given to Nebuchadnezzar as a gift. Nebuchadnezzar would have never conquered Judah. The holy vessels of God were given as a gift for Nebuchadnezzar to keep. That Nebuchadnezzar may know that there is a God of heaven. Not only that, the most powerful evangelists were given to Nebuchadnezzar. People like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Hazariah. These were the most powerful evangelists of the time. They were very close to Nebuchadnezzar. They lived Christianity. They lived truth. Their life reflected the God of heaven and to the that Nebuchadnezzar should come to an understanding of who God is. Brothers and sisters, think of the things which God has done to you to help you to understand his message. Now let's look at Daniel chapter 1, 18. Now at the end of the days that the king had said he should bring them in, then the princess of the eunuchs brought them bef in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them was not was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Hazariah. Therefore stood they before the king. So they, these four evangelists, they were brought close to the king to preach to the king, to teach the king, to demonstrate to the king what it means to be a child of God. What was the intention of God? When this gospel is understood by Nebuchadnezzar, it has already been understood by all because Nebuchadnezzar will help humanity to know that there is a God of heaven. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 2 verse 46. The Bible says, then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldest reveal this secret. So now the king, after Daniel interpreted his dream, after Daniel reminded his dream of Daniel chapter 2, he realized that surely there is a God and there is a God of heaven and there is no other God like this. God is trying to help Nebuchadnezzar to understand that you know there is one God to be worshipped and this God, this God is the only true God, the God of heaven. But in chapter 3 from verse 24, the Bible says, then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spoke and said unto the counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no head, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. The king's eyes are opened. After he had thrown the three Hebrew boys in the fire because of their rejection of to worship idols, and God of heaven decided to open his eyes, and he see the fourth person, he said, the fourth person is like unto the Son of God. How did he know about the Son of God? It is because the four Hebrew boys lived according to the word of God, and their character reflected the Son of God. And if there was 
any evangelism which was done, there is no better evangelism which was like that which was done in Babylon to the extent that the king could see that this is the character of God in his children. And when the Son of God was revealed, he could tell that this is what they were describing. Now verse 28, the Bible said, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angels and delivered his servants that trust in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not save nor worship any god except their god on god so after the king had understood all this after the king had a clear understanding of the king of god heaven still he did not change and on this juncture the king did not stop there he went on to make a decree which was of no value. Look at the decree. Therefore, I make a decree that every person, people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their homes shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Oh, yes. The king has admitted that there is no other God. There is only one God and the God of heaven is a much better God than anything else. And everyone should not speak anything amiss against this God. The question I ask myself is, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 of Daniel. Years had passed while the Hebrew boys were in Babylon. Was God able to reach Nebuchadnezzar? Everything was done that could reach the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. All the gospel was preached. All the signs and miracles were done. All the wonders. But the question is, did God reach him? No. The heart of Nebuchadnezzar never changed. Therefore, because of the failure of Nebuchadnezzar, God decided to give him plan B. Therefore, he gave him a dream. That's why we now see the dream of chapter 4. Now the question is, was God dealing with only Nebuchadnezzar? No, God was actually dealing with the entire Babylon. But he used Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king. The people of Babylon will listen to their king better. But now, what exactly was the problem of Babylon? What was the sin of Babylon? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 21, 9, And behold, he cometh a chariot of men. Behold, he cometh a chariot of men with a couple of horsemen. And he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And all the graven images of her gods he has broken unto the ground. So the main problem was that image worship. This was a common sin of Babylon to worship other, idol, uh, other gods. Remember the, the first commandment said, thou shalt, not make, uh, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. The second one, thou shalt not make unto thee any grieving image. There was idol worship and self-glorification. These were the main sins of Babylon. These were the main sins of Nebuchadnezzar. And because of self-glorification, which comes with pride, he could not listen or he could not understand the call of God. At Jeremiah chapter 51 verse 6, Flee out of the midst of Babylon and deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recommend. Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. Why are the nations mad? Because they are drunk with the wine of Babylon, the teachings of Babylon. Verse 8 of Jeremiah chapter 51. Behold, Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. Hold for her. Take balm for the for her pain. If she be, if so, she may be healed. But unfortunately, Babylon will not be healed. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let us go everyone into his own country. For her judgment reach unto heaven and is lifted up even to the skies. So Babylon will not repent. There is no hope for Babylon. 
Why is the sin of Babylon so great? Idol worship, arrogance, fullness of bread, ruthlessness to the nations, heavily taxing the nation, destroying without mercy, no regard of the God of heaven. Therefore, her sins reached unto heaven. We will come to the spiritual Babylon in the uh, presentations coming. But let me go to verse 40, Jeremiah chapter 41, 47. It says, uh, 51, 47. Therefore, behold, the days come that I will do judgment upon the grieving images of Babylon. And her whole land shall be confounded, and all her slain shall fall in the midst of her. Then the heaven and the earth and all that is in them will sing for Babylon. For the spoilers shall come unto her from the north, says the Lord. Yes, destruction will come to Babylon because of her grieving images, because of her iniquity. Because of her ruthlessness, because of her failure to repent. Now, Isaiah chapter 13, verse 19. And Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans, excellence shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah? Nothing remained. Why was it? Now, look at verse 20. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from the generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch their tent, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of uh, doleful creatures, and all owls shall dwell there, and uh, satires shall dance there. So what exactly is happening? Babylon will be destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah, never to be rehabilitated again. Why? There is no hope for the Babylonian system. It has fallen. Daniel chapter, Genesis chapter 11, it has fallen again. Daniel chapter 5, never to be rebuilt again. There is, however, hope for the individuals in Babylon who decide to give their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. But spiritual Babylon is already fallen and she will never repent. Now, what exactly is the actual sin of Babylon? We have dealt with the sin of grieving images. But let me actually come to another point which is very interesting in um, manuscript release uh, 1903. That's uh, uh, letter 114. Let a people boast themselves in their own wisdom let them exalt self and uh, indulge pride, and the result will surely follow. Brothers and sisters, if we boast, if we become proud, if we fail to understand our position, the result will definitely follow. As surely as the sun shines by day, so surely does pride go before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Let a church become proud and boastful and the church will be laid low. Let those in charge of any institution become presumptuous, taking to themselves the credit for the success that has come to them in certain lines. Let them glory in their wisdom and their efficiency and they will certainly be brought to the humiliation. So, pride was the main problem in Babylon. Pride is the main issue in, even among the children of, of God today. But now let's actually return to the dream of Nebuchadnezzar because of his sin of pride, because of his failure to repent. God decided to talk to him in a dream of a big tree. Fortunately, on this one in chapter 4 of Daniel chapter 4, he did not forget the dream. But now the mess, his, uh, his uh, Chaldeans or his soothsayers or his wise men could not help him to know the interpretation. Therefore, he called Daniel. Now Daniel had listened to the dream. Now look at the reaction of Daniel. Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished for one hour and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation therefore trouble thee. Belshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee and the interpretation therefore to thine enemies. Daniel could not believe that God was about to deal that way with Nebuchadnezzar. 
Daniel could not take it that God had, was about to do such kind of ruthless. That's why he said, listen, uh, king, let this dream be to thy enemies. But now, what was the problem with Nebuchadnezzar? And what exactly was his sin? Was his sin different from the sins of Babylon? And why would Daniel be so troubled? Now look at verse 27, the Bible says, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be accepted unto thee, and break off this, thy sins by righteousness, and thy iniquity by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. In other words, this comes after he had related the meaning of the dream. And he said, this could be avoided. And the best way to avoid this, O king, is, you could repent. The best way to avoid this, O king, is to show mercy to the poor, to show kindness. You are so harsh. You are so ruthless. You don't seem to have a regard of those people around you. Please be kind. If you could be kind, if you could be merciful, if you could be long-suffering, then you could avert this. Brothers and sisters, surely... There was need for a change in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. So even us today, there is need for repentance, to show kindness, to show the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, goodness, kindness, long-suffering. These things were missing in Nebuchadnezzar. Look at manuscript uh, uh, 29. Uh, this is uh, 1895. What was the sin of King Nebuchadnezzar? Pride. He had placed himself where God should be. In other words, he was a god to the Babylonians. What was the retribution? Degradation. His reason was taken from him. The Lord would chastise his people. Those who are true at heart will see what his purpose is. Not merely to separate the sin from the sinner, but by his own light to reveal the sinner which lead the soul out. To reveal the sin which lead the soul away from God and which would be its ruin unless corrected. So God was trying to help the king. Say, listen, we want to separate you, the sinner, from the sin. And we want to help you to understand your sin. Your sin is pride. Your sin is arrogance. So now the things that make you to be proud, we're going to remove them. Not only that, we'll put you in the forest for seven years. And in the forest for seven years, you will not be able to sit as a king in your palace for those seven years. In those seven years, you go and learn with animals. In those seven years, you be wet with the dew of heaven. In those seven years, you walk on four as an animals. You be dwelling with the baboons in the forest until you know that there is a God in heaven. You know, that's a very powerful lesson or that's a very painful lesson of being humbled. You know, the book of First Peter chapter 5 says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God rather than being humbled. Please humble yourself. And we're told that from the story, history of the characters described in the word of God, we learn that prosperity is dangerous to spiritual life. Now, prosperity is dangerous to pre-spiritual life. Brothers and sisters, it's not bad to be rich. We want resources. It's not evil to be rich. We talk of rich people like Abraham. We talk of rich people like Job. We talk of rich people like Solomon in the Bible. Let me therefore qualify this quotation. From the story of the characters described in the word of God, we learn that prosperity is dangerous to spiritual life. Oh yes, if prosperity will be a hindrance so that you don't understand when God is talking. If prosperity is a hindrance so that you don't understand your sin or you will not be able to take heed to the word of God, then prosperity could be dangerous and is definitely on that note is very dangerous. It says, it is not those who have lost their pro property that are most likely to forget God. 
it is not those who have lost their property that are most likely to forget God. It is those who have a measure of prosperity or who have been successful in their plans. The cup that is most difficult to carry is not the one that is empty, but the one that is full to the brim. This must be balanced with nice precision. Oh, this is a, this is a very powerful quotation. As I lived in England for a very long time, the question was asked, why is it that in England our spirituality is so low? What is the problem? And then somebody say, prosperity. When people are living pretty, they don't seem to have an understanding of God. When people have got so much, they have no need. In fact, I worked with this gentleman, Harry. That was in 1999. We were working at First Call working in uh, Christian Salverson. As we were working there, I started preaching to Harry. Harry was a white man. He said, oh, good are you preaching to me. You know, the gospel is for the poor. I said, why is it so, Harry? Because the poor are thinking they, 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 they want to be blessed, so they, they are in need of something, so they would rather seek God to be blessed. But we, the rich, we don't need anything. Therefore, you don't see the gospel is not for the whites. This was the thinking of Ari. I disagree with him. But however, on this point, I realize what he meant. When people are so prosperous, they are in need of nothing. They may not see the need of God. Therefore, sometimes God had to remove the environment. He had to change the circumstances so that he could reach us. To Nebuchadnezzar, God removed him from his throne temporarily. He took away all the pleasures around him so that he can be in an environment when he can hear the voice of God. And this is what you call plan B. When God has blessed us, when God has given us everything, when God has reached us where we are, when God, has when God has prospered us, and if we cannot understand his voice, and if God wants to save us, he will do everything that is necessary. And God, in his mercy and love, he can actually remove all the comfort. As God removed the comfort from Belsha Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's life changed. But now, before we got, get to that, let's go to verse 33 of Daniel chapter 4. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers and his nails like uh, bed's clothes. clothes. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. What a painful lesson for Nebuchadnezzar to be reduced to that level, somebody who was so high. But God is long suffering and he's gracious. He can do anything to save. At the end of the day, Nebuchadnezzar did not lose anything. God was taking the pride away. He was separating the sinner from the sin. The sin was a sin of pride. And he was separating that pride from Nebuchadnezzar. Blessed are we, brothers and sisters. If we can separate ourselves by ourselves from the sin of pride, if God can allow us to give away all the pride just by ourselves. But if we do not do that and God wants to reach us, brothers and sisters, plan B will come. And the plan B is very painful. That's why the singers say, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Now, Daniel in Revelation commentary says, Nebuchadnezzar failed to profit by the warning he had received. Yet God bore with him 12 months before he blew... The, the blow fell. All the time he was cherishing pride in his heart and at length it reached a climax beyond which God could not suffer it to pass. The king walked in the palace and as he looked forth upon the wonders of 
the wonder of the world, great Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms. He forgot the source of all his strength and greatness and exclaimed, Is not this the great Babylon that I have built? The time had come for his humiliation. Brothers and sisters, do we re realize that what we are is the blessing of God? You know, one of my sisters shared this on her phone. It was written, all I have is a gift. All I have is a gift from God. Therefore, do I have anything to glory in myself? At that very juncture, we are told that a voice from heaven again announced the threatened judgment and divine providence proceed immediately to execute it. His reason departed. No longer the pomp and glory of his great city charmed him. When God, with a touch of his finger, took away his capability to appreciate and enjoy it, he forsook the dwelling of men and sought a home and companionship among the beasts of the forest. <laughs> so, <laughs> the question is, could this have been avoided? Oh, yes. Had he listened to Daniel, had he changed his lifestyle, he could have avoided this. But uh, the big man could not humble himself. But if God could humble Nebuchadnezzar, can he do the same to you? Can he do the same to me? Ellen White then said, the message from God was fulfilled. The king of Babylon, because he neglected to heed the testimonies of warning, that he had been given him suffered the most humiliating punishment. Warnings had been given him of God. Daniel had appealed to him to change his course of action, to break off his sins by righteousness in order that this terrible sentence might not be fulfilled, but self-indulgence, inordinate ambition, was not eradicated from his heart and after a time revealed itself in words of vanity. You know, if there's one thing that we need is a change of heart. But the change of heart is not easy. Many times people will say, I've repented and they will go back to their sin. I've changed and they will go back to their sin. So God decided to render a lesson through Nebuchadnezzar to all the world that we may understand how God can deal with his people. Especially when he ex exhausted all the other easy means. He go to the most difficult one. But most of the times God is successful. It says, it was not alone for Nebuchadnezzar's sake that all his this occurred, but for the sake of all nations and kings, not only of that time, but of all time, even to the world end. So this was given not only for Nebuchadnezzar to understand, but for the kings of the world that will live after that they may know how God would deal with those who rebel against him. But the question is, was the lesson understood by the kings that followed? The scriptures talks of the failure of Belshazzar to understand the lesson which he could have learned. God, while he was punishing Nebuchadnezzar, he was preaching to Belshazzar. He was preaching to all the other kings that followed. He was preaching to Nebonidas. He was preaching to the people in Babylon. He is preaching to us that we may know the results of pride. We may know what happened when we objected to the principles of God. Now the Bible says in Daniel chapter 5.22, And thou his son, referring to Belshazzar, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thy heart, thou, though thou knowest all this. What did he knew? He knew everything that we have covered. The banishment of his grandfather to go into the forest for seven years, to behave like an animal, to eat as an animal. He also knew about how God gave the prosperity to his grandfather, how the children of Israel were handed over to, to, to Babylon. And he knew how God preached the gospel to Belshazzar and how the ambassadors from 
Judah. I'm talking of Hananiah, Mishael, and Hazariah lived. He knew all the truth. He knew about the temperance of Daniel chapter 1. He knew that there is another kingdom that will come after Babylon according to Daniel chapter 2. And he knew that there is a God that needs to be worshipped above all other gods. And we are to give homage to this God. And he had a full understanding of the repentance of his grandfather. But the man could not humble himself. He walked into the same sins. Therefore, his sentence was different from that of Nebuchadnezzar. Now look at verse 23. But he has lifted up thyself against the God of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before thee. And thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drank wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and of gold, of brass, of wood, of iron, and stone which see not no hear no no and the god in whose hand thy breath is and whose are all thy ways has thou not glorified so what did the king do he regressed he left the religion which was adopted by nebuchadnezzar and he went back to the religion of babylon nebuchadnezzar repented and forsook everything but his son decided not to repent he decided to continue in the sins of their grandfathers and what was driving him prophets and kings page two uh, four five two three in his pride and arrogance with a reckless feeling of security belshazzar made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand all the attraction that wealth and power could command added splendor to the scene. Beautiful women with their enchantments were among the guests in, the att in attendance at the royal banquet. Men of genius and education were there. Princess and statesmen drank wine like water and revealed under its madness influence with reason dethroned through shameless intoxication and with low impulses and passion now in the ascendance the king himself took the lead in riotous orgy oh yes he did worse and what did he command bring the holy vessels there was nothing holy anymore there was no limitation to what he could do because he neglected the opportunity for salvation now, the most painful part is Prophets and Kings, page 522, paragraph 2, says, Many had been his opportunities to know the divine will and to understand his responsibility of rendering obedience thereto. He had known of his grandfather's banishment by the decree of God from the society of men, and he was familiar with Nebuchadnezzar's conversion and miraculous restoration, but Nebuchadnezzar Belshazzar allowed the love of pleasure and self-glorification to efface the lesson that he should never have forgotten. He wasted the opportunities graciously granted him and neglected to use the means within his reach for becoming more fully acquainted with truth. That which Nebuchadnezzar had finally gained at the cost of untold suffering and humiliation, Belshazzar passed with indifference. What else could be done when everything has been done? The lessons were very clear to the young man. There was no need for him to go through the same. God was very patient with Nebuchadnezzar, but God was not very patient with Belshazzar. The years that Belshazzar lived, he lived during the time when Nebuchadnezzar was there. He was watching the life of Nebuchadnezzar. He was watching the life of Hananiah, Mishael, and Hazariah, and Daniel. This was enough to preach to him, but he did not take that serious. Brothers and sisters, we have an opportunity for truth. We have internet. We have now, now there is free Wi-Fi and the media is still open. We have an opportunity, we have got our Bibles. We have got all that is necessary to reveal truth to us. We have the health message. We have the spiritual prophecy.
We have the best preachers of the world. We have all the truth. The question is, why can't we decide for salvation? Can God do anything? Brothers and sisters, we may not get the opportunity of Nebuchadnezzar to give, be given seven more years in a different environment. We could be, end up like Belshazzar. Hither too shall you go, but no further. You had opportunity and God was talking to you, but you did not regard it. You know, it says many disregard the light and opportunities granted them by God and stubbornly follow their own way. Thus did Bel Belshazzar, although God had revealed himself in honor and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar closed his eyes to the light and chose his own course. Brothers and sisters, how is it with us today? Can we open our eyes to the light shining? Open our eyes to the truth revealed in the word of God. Open our eyes to what God is saying to us. Blessed are we if we could change like Nebuchadnezzar. Happy are we if God will give us such an opportunity. But brothers and sisters, God is giving us an opportunity every day. Our end could be like that of Belshazzar. May the Lord help us to take his word seriously. That probation may not close before us like as it did to Belshazzar because of failure to realize the lesson around us. It is my prayer that as God has given us all this chance to repent, we may use this opportunity and salvation will be ours. Shall we pray? Loving Father of mercy and compassion, as you dealt with Belshazzar, so you deal with many. But Lord, we've understood that you are a God who is long-suffering, who is compassionate. You don't want anyone to perish. Therefore, we pray that as you extend this mercy to us, we may use this day to give our hearts to you. Pour your spirit upon us. Grant us according to thy grace and thy power in Jesus' name. Amen. Until then, brothers and sisters, may the Lord truly bless you. I look forward to see you in the next edition. We've got quite a lot of things to look at. The central bank digital currency in Europe, the digital ID. is something very interesting, which is something, in, a lot of things interesting happening in the world. But enjoy the day, enjoy the Sabbath, and I look forward to see you soon. Don't forget to share the message. Don't forget to subscribe. God bless.